Hey, welcome to Chat Cinema. I'm talking to filmmaker Mike Donahue about his live short film, Troy. Mike, that was a funny film. Let's get into it. I, Thank I, you. First question is, how did you construct the narrative? Because it's, it's an LGBTQ gay film. I don't know all these damn uh, letters here. Uh, but the character is not really central in the story. I mean, he's obviously a very important part of it, but it's not the central focus. Tell me, how yeah. did you construct that? How did you construct the narrative? Yeah, I, I think one thing we knew is we were interested in creating a story that was about a surprising kind of intimacy and the kind of profound impact that a stranger can have on your life. That, that thing of like, somebody who doesn't even know you exist can actually alter your life in life-changing ways and they still never know that you existed. And I think there's something both really beautiful about that and kind of bittersweet. And especially in a big city like New York or LA where there's so many people and there's such proximity, you see the same people every day but you never actually talk to them but you start to recognize them. And I don't know if other people do this, but like I'll write stories about what's going on for the people that I see every day whose names I don't even know. And so I think that's, that's a bit of where it came from. Um, and I think one of the things we were excited to do is create a story in which um, we sort of know as much about the titular character as the main couple that we're going through the story with. And the challenge for us was they get sort of little IV drips of information about him. Um, and I think that's part of why they get so turned on to the idea of him and his life in all of its sort of peaks and valleys, not just the sex, but also his extreme heartbreak and his anger and his rage and his loneliness that like each little clue just activates like a greater desire to sleuth and find out more. Um, and so hopefully it does the same thing for the audience that like you just get like the next little thing that helps you form a picture so that by the end of the film, hopefully you have a sense of like a complete rich human being, but you've actually only maybe heard him speak on camera. Actually, never. He never talks on camera. You've seen him like three times, but you've overheard him a couple times. And yet at the end of the day, the audience too sort of still knows nothing about this guy. And so that, that was sort of the challenge of it that we were excited about. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, was there a bit of, I guess, this sense of Stockholm syndrome or this misplaced bond <laughs> that went on in the story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, this is at least true, I, I think, for me and people I know in New York, you know, we live in these tiny apartments, and especially if you work from home, you spend so much time trapped in these little shoe boxes, and um, little things can start to take on, like, epic sort of scale. Um, and I, I do think there's a thing at the beginning of the film where like that noise, that neighbor noise is inescapable. It's so loud as if like he's reverbing and echoing through their apartment as if that whole shared wall is like some sort of sound drum or something. Um, but it's also 24 seven, which is, you know, sort of like soul crushing imposition, but also part of the mystery and the, the sort of like the weirdness of it is that he seemingly never runs out of this voracious appetite. Um, and I do think because it becomes kind of all consuming for them when they start to get curious about it and instead of being irritated or annoyed about it, they start to lean into like, who might their neighbor be? That also becomes kind of all consuming for them. Well, let me ask you, when you and Jen Silverman was the co-writer of it, right? Uh, Jen Silverman was the writer, yeah. We sort of yeah, okay. came up with the idea together and like storyboarded it and beat it out and generated. Okay. Were you a little worried about how the characters would be perceived as prying or, you know, a bit of, I guess, kind of a busybody, for example? Were you worried about the sympathy <laughs> level of the audience? Like, Yeah, I guess, I, I think for us, it felt like it was important that um, ultimately there's a lot of heart to the film and a lot of joy to it that I think their journey and hopefully what the film does for an audience is it's about waking up a kind of curiosity and an empathy for people who at first glance sort of don't look anything like us but the more you get to know them and the more you get to know their heartbreak and their pain and also their joy and their victories that that creates um em empathy and i think that that hopefully is why they never feel sort of like irritatingly or dismissively like busy bodies but i think the other part of it is that you know for us it was about a couple who i think is not an unhealthy in an unhealthy relationship, but I do think they're in a sort of like 
overly settled or overly comfortable relationship and they've started to kind of like give in to the routine of eating dinners on the couch, not speaking to each other. And they sort of live their lives in like a very narrow bandwidth of experiences. And I think one of the great gifts that Troy gives them is he kind of wakes them back up to the highs and lows of life's experiences and also kind of like reignites their curiosity and their passion for being in the world, for people in the world, for each other. He gives them something to share as a shared passion. And so I think because hopefully he feels like such a gift to the two of them and that is so genuine and so real, hopefully that also is something the audience can connect to. Sorry about that, guys. I hope the sound is okay on this. Uh, nothing we can do about it. Hey, it's the Zoom yeah. world. I think um, my dog is playing with his toy, so I just took that away from him. And if you were hearing like a bouncing rubber thing, yeah. I, that's my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, let me ask you. Okay, so Troy is an OnlyFans dream come true. You know, he has a physical presence. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you sort of made his character a bit fragile that was the detail I wasn't expecting yeah it um I think we were excited to create and I think I so often am in stories that I'm drawn to create a set of assumptions that an audience might have about somebody and then constantly sort of defy those assumptions break them down um show you a different facet of that person that you didn't think this this guy and that body and that elevator with her is going to have such vulnerability and be so comfortable with his vulnerability. Um, so that that sort of like mystery and surprise and defying expectations is something that we were very like calculatedly interested in. Okay, let me uh, let, let me ask you something. Your film has is qualifying for the Oscar this year. Are you is, excited yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, this is my debut film. I've been, for the last 10 years, I've been working as a theater director, you know, doing new plays. Um, this is the first film I've made, and I feel like every step of our journey that we got to premiere at Tribeca, that we even got to go to Sundance last year, oh, um, let alone, like, the awards that we've won, it, it all feels uh, truly unexpected and humbling, and I I'm, I'm, have no idea what will happen and no expectations for it. I'm just, like, incredibly grateful and excited that we even have this opportunity for visibility and for more people to see us. What are you working on next? Uh, I'm about to go into rehearsals for a play in Chicago uh, that is a piece that Jen is working on with me and uh, the actress Dana Delaney, and it's it's based on something that happened in Dana's own life about a decade ago. She uh, was leading her show, Body of Proof on ABC, and it was sort of early days of Twitter, and the networks were making their stars get Twitter accounts to promote their shows, and Dana sort of fell into this six-month-long, uh, profoundly rich relationship with this 13-year-old boy who was dying of cancer, and also his Marine brother and his grandmother, and she gets kind of pulled into this family and it's it's sort of part love story with the kid and the family. It, it also becomes a kind of a ghost story and a bit of a thriller. So um, we're making that. And then Jen and I are working on trying to get our first feature made. So well, I think after this, you shouldn't have a hard time. I, I have a <laughs> <book for me. laughs> Yeah. Would you consider this movie a LGBTQ film, or I, I, I didn't consider it that, but would, I mean, would you classify it as that, since we have to classify everything these days? Yeah, I, I don't know, gosh. I mean, I feel like insofar as I am and so many of the creators and artists on the, on the film are LGBTQ, um, totally, insofar as like the titular character is, is queer and it's about um, a seemingly straight couple, uh, crashing into like an un unapologetically sort of like brazenly queer person who is just like loudly unapologetically living his life and that queer couple uh, that straight couple um, sort of learning to like embrace him and have empathy for him um, insofar as that it's like about that I, th I guess it's a queer film like um, we we screened at Outfest last year and I was panicked going into it I was like this is going to be the straightest film in all of Outfest because our lead couple are seemingly straight um but then we screened in my hometown you know I grew up in a conservative midwest town and um we had we had a little talk back after the screening and this um you know person said it, it was very well-meaning and really loved the movie said um she thought this was such a great film and it was so important because it taught her that gay people are people too. 
Yeah. Um, which is, you know, not, I, I think like not how I would articulate <laughs> what I think the film is trying to do, but I, I actually really appreciate that that's what she got out of it. Cause I, I do think it's a film about empathy and curiosity. And so um, I, I think in, insofar as it's about just having more openness to people who we don't think are like us, um, it, it is queer. I just found it funny in just the circumstances. Good. That's why I said I would not consider it, you know, this exclusive category. I, it's more of a comedy of manner, it's a comedy of situation. I, I, I was laughing at times. I try not to give Good. it away. That's my, my <laughs> hope is that it's fun and that you laugh out loud when you watch it yeah. like at your computer or whatever. So yeah, that, exactly. That's I, my greatest I, wish. And that's why I said, I just, I found it funny. Congratulations. I hope you go very far with it and all your other future endeavors. Thank, Thank you, you so Thanks much, Michael. Yeah. Thank you.